Is Tristan here? I thought I saw you carry him in. Won't you let our folks see this little fellow right here? This is Mr. Tristan Scott. He hadn't been around long, but I'll tell you right now, he's here, amen. Yes, sir. <laughs> have to dig him out of there. <laughs> oh. My, my. <laughs> <laughs> That's one proud papa right there. Looks to me like. Well, I'm glad for you. That's good. Amen. I never, never cease to marvel at birth, a live birth. That's quite a remarkable thing. I'm telling you. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray that you give me unction tonight and give me wisdom of scriptures. Father, teach me that I might teach others and give me understanding now. And let me be sensitive to your sweet Holy Spirit. And do what you want to do in here tonight, Lord. Not just another meeting. This may be the meeting that matters the most in some lives in this house tonight. In thy holy name we pray and amen. You know, one of the bad mistakes or, I guess, sins, you might call it, Christians make is becoming comfortable and at ease with holy things. When you consider the fact that when you come together as a body of Christ like you have tonight, he said, I'll be in your midst. You don't have to work him up. No, you don't. No, you don't. You don't have to scream him in. You don't have to do that. If you'll open your heart tonight... You'd be amazed at what the Holy Spirit can do in this house. You'd be amazed. This is his body. His body has met. He has but one body, just one. I'm not saying by that that we are the only church, but I am saying tonight there is no other body apart from the body that's meeting right now here on Woodrow Drive. In the book of Revelation, if you'll turn there back with me tonight, please. Revelation chapter number 1. The Apostle John, who, with all indications, outlived all the other apostles. The Lord chose 12 men to reveal His Word to. He had many disciples, but in order to write Scripture and not have a bunch of confusion, 12 hand-picked men. One of them was a devil. So the Apostle Paul replaced him. And uh, as far as writing Scripture is concerned, I know Matthias was the one chosen in Acts, but Paul replaced him in writing Scripture. And uh, can you imagine what it would be if you had 300 people writing the New Testament and all of them had different viewpoints and this and that? You see, God chose 12 men, inspired them to write. Now, they didn't all write books, but they are apostles to teach, administer the Word. And a number of them wrote Scripture. And what we have in the book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. It's so important to understand that because there's an awful lot of stuff out there that purports to be Scripture that's not. It's not. There's a lot of stuff out there that purports to be revelation from God that's not. I can, uh, you know, I can show you book after book after book that says, Thus saith the Lord, but that's, it's rejected. It's not the Lord speaking. But... The thing that I am struck with so much from the first chapter of Revelation is the identity that Jesus Christ is given here and the description that we have of Him. There is no more detailed description in the Word of God than you'll find in Revelation chapter number 1. As a matter of fact, the most detailed description of the Son of God is found right here. Don't you think it's quite remarkable that it relates to the church? The world never sees Him like that. The world is not, uh, does, not reveal, does not receive that kind of a description of the Son of God. Why? They don't know Him like we know Him. They can't receive Him like we can receive Him. And they can't hear Him like we can hear Him. So the Apostle John starts with the church. The uh, second and third and fourth chapter all the way up to the fifth chapter of the book of Revelation 
The church is involved. And then the church disappears. It's gone. It's gone from the earth. And the tribulation period comes on. Time of Jacob's trouble. Not the time of the church's trouble. But the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Israel's trouble. I do not believe for one minute the church is going to go through the tribulation. I believe the apostate church will. It will go headlong into it. But I do not believe the body of Christ is going into the tribulation. But in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, Jesus Christ is presented to us in a marvelous way. But the first thing that he does is deal with the church personally, not through a messenger, but personally, like he never has anywhere else in the Bible. I want you to notice what he says here in verse number 9, Revelation 1. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That isle is still there. So it's a historical geographical location that can be pointed. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Saying. And now the Lord Jesus begins to speak. I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. And what thou seest write in a book. And send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Unto Ephesus. To Smyrna to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And these seven churches, as I said to you Sunday night, are there. No congregation now, but the remnant of what had once been a church is still there. He said, I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and behold, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, seven candlesticks lit up the tabernacle, not the temple, but the tabernacle, had seven. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. This is how he wanted to present himself to the church. This is not the world seeing him like this. It's the body of Christ. His feet like a defined brass as if they burned in a furnace. His voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Now remember the location. He's standing in the midst of seven golden candlesticks. And he has in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. Later on in the book of Revelation, heaven opens, and when it opens, he comes on a white horse, and out of his mouth goeth forth a sharp two-edged sword. So this two-edged sword shows up again in the book of Revelation at the second coming. But when he comes with the second advent and the two-edged sword, it is to do war. It's to make war. No peace involved. No chastening. No uh, instruction. This time the sword is for one purpose. Destruction. But notice what he said here. This sword goes forth out of his mouth. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying to me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. He was scared to death. He was scared to death. He was trembling and astonished. He couldn't handle what he was seeing. Well, you know, I couldn't either. If he showed up in here tonight looking like he does in the book of Revelation chapter number 1, we'd all have our knees knocking together. Every last one of us. You could hear our teeth chattered. I'm talking about fright like you wouldn't believe. He said, I fell as dead. But he said, fear not. I'm the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. So the first message he wanted the church to get is the fact I'm alive. I live. That's all important. Because if he's not alive, nothing else matters. All of the miracles are just uh, so much as Janice and Jambres and the rest of them perform miracles. Satan can perform miracles. So what? It's not a matter of miracles. It's a matter of the one who has power over life and death. I'm alive, he said. And the life is far more than physical life. When he arose from the dead, it was more, far more than simply his body coming back to life again. If when he arose from the dead, he was the second Adam, the last Adam, the second man. And when he did that, something altogether changed in God's view and relationship with mankind. 
For now it's resurrection life. That's life that has been through death. And death has put its claim upon it. And death is the death, the debt of death has been paid. And now there's no more that death can do. Isn't that amazing? Death has exhausted itself on the Lord Jesus Christ. I am he that was, that was dead. And behold, he said, I'm alive forevermore. And note carefully. He said, write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. So that's how we understand the book of Revelation. Past, present, and future. The mystery of the seven stars. Mysterion. A mystery. Something that is not understood unless it's revealed. God must tell us what it means. Like the mystery of the body of Christ. The mystery of iniquity. The mystery of godliness. God must define that for us. We can't, you can't just scratch around and, and have, a, uh, have about a, a bunch of highbrow conjecture. God's got to reveal it to you. What does it mean? What is the mystery of iniquity? What is the mystery of godliness? What is the mystery of the body of Christ? What is the mystery of the rapture? What is that? What does that mean? And notice carefully what he says right here. He said, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks that he stood in the midst of. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The part of the seven candlesticks, easy enough to understand. Seven churches. To the church at Ephesus, he says, you've left your first love. Repent. For if you do not, he said, I will come and take your candlestick away. So that's easy enough to understand. That's clear and simple. Of course, what the candlestick represents is a different matter altogether. For the candlestick was where Christ stood. And he stood in the midst of the candlestick. A candle is to give forth light and illuminate. The candle illuminates the one before it. But the candle also gives off light showing that there is something within to produce light. The church of God is the source of light. We don't reflect the light of this world. We don't seek its instruction. We're not interested in pop theology and pop psychology. I couldn't care less what they think. The source of truth and light and salt is the church of God. But not people meeting in a building, reading, uh, reading contemporary books. That light comes from the power of the Holy Spirit who comes within us and inspires us. He shall guide you into all truth. Therefore, if we receive the light of His Word, then therefore light is going to go forth from the church. A good analogy is a lighthouse. It's a good one because it sends forth the light and where it sends the light is into the darkness. And the darkness is an indication that those out there can't find their way. But when the light goes out, it illuminates their path. And that's the purpose of the church. It's to send out the light, to send out the truth. It's not our job to go out, to go out here and compromise and try to and try, to, and try to piecemeal the message and water it down and, and make it palatable and, and, and acceptable, you know, to an unsaved man, make him feel good about it. Like, for example, the unsaved are seeking God, the seeker-sensitive church. The Bible said, no man seeketh after the Lord. That's what the Bible says. So whoever created the idea of the, secret, the, the seeker-sensitive church, he didn't get it from the Scriptures. You're not seeking God. You may be seeking comfort. You may be seeking wealth. You may be seeking an out from your problems. You may be seeking a better time, a better day. You know, you may be seeking relief, but you're not seeking God. It takes the Holy Ghost for you to seek God. So the light of the church is a candlestick, and He stands in the midst as if to say, I'm here, you're around me, and this is what it's about. It's about the fact that we have a position and a place. And our position and place is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not angels. Angels have their place. But it's not my place to illuminate angels. It's not my place to receive from an angel. Though if God sends one as a messenger, fine. But my message must come from God Himself. And notice he says he had seven stars in his hands. This is one of the most controversial part of the text. Because that's the hardest to interpret. What does it mean? It says that they're the angel of the church. But you know as well as I do that the term angel used in the Bible can be used in a lot of different ways. 
An angel in the Bible is a, is, is a messenger. An angel in the Bible is an appearance. For example, children, the Bible said, their angel doth behold the face of our Father which is in heaven. Well, you know that a child is here in this earth, but it has an angel that is literally manifesting a presence before God. Now, how that works, I'm not too sure I understand. But when God sees that angel, he sees that child because that child represents, that angel represents that child. How many know what I'm talking about? So an angel, therefore, is a, is, is a representation. And you read in the New Testament where they said they, they saw his angel referring to a manifestation, a representation. And an angel is a messenger, though. It's a, it's a message carrier. And the seven stars held in his hand uh, could represent pastors. It could represent those that are appointed by the hand of the Lord to shepherd his flock. And God appoints the pastor. He's the one who calls them to preach. And uh, no man takes that title upon himself. And no man just flippantly says, well, I guess I'll preach. And we have a whole branch of fundamental babble. Uh, uh, yeah, I said babblism. <laughs> Sometimes a slip of the tongue hits it right on the head. Doesn't it? <laughs> a whole branch of fundamental Baptist <laughs> that, uh, that don't believe in the call to preach. You know, they do away with that. And that, that's a solemn thing. I mean, folks, I, I, I didn't just decide to start preaching. The preaching of the gospel is my life. It's not, it's, not, uh, it's not a vocation and it's not something I do. It's what I am. You see what I mean? It's what I am. In the right circumstances, right place, I'll preach. Because that's what I am. So the pastor of a church is one who's been placed by the hand of God to lead that assembly. And if he's truly a pastor of the church of God the way he ought to be, he is simply leading and pointing men to the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. Not him. I'm an under shepherd that points to him. Therefore, I am in the hand of the master to turn any way that he would. See, in his hand. And it's a very simple matter for him to reach up and pluck one of those stars out. When it's no longer of any use to him. When the star feels like the star is the issue. Instead of the one holding in the hand. Now you can't prove tonight that the star represents the pastor. But it's a, it's a pretty good analogy. And I'll tell you why. The Bible says that we watch for your souls. As a pastor. I have a responsibility to do that. That means that I not only am responsible to teach you the truth. I'm responsible to watch for heresy. And when I see heresy begin to come. That I should be read enough, I should be alert enough, I should be aware enough to, to meet it head on. And that's the responsibility of a pastor, is to deal with heresy. And folks, there's plenty of heretics around. Plenty of them around. So I teach you all the time in here, constantly, I am, I am constantly bringing before you that this church is made up of ministers. Every last one of you are able ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You are. You are not the laity. And I'm not the clergy. That is a professional religious caste or class. And I'm not part of that. I am a Christian just like you. And a minister just like you. And the only difference is that I have been placed as the head of the pastor. Therefore, I'm accountable for this local assembly. And I have to give an account. That's the difference. And the Bible says that that pastor is, is worthy of double honor. And it says to obey them that have the rule over you. And that rule is simply in spiritual matters as my responsibility brings it upon me. You see, the first one that God holds accountable in this assembly is me. I'll be the first one he comes to if something starts in here that, that's not right. If some new doctrine comes in that's not right. If something that's unscriptural or something begins to happen in this congregation that I'm aware of and I just turn a, 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 turn a, turn a deaf ear to it or, a, or turn away from it, I'm accountable for that. I can't do that. I can't do that. I can't just run off. God holds me accountable. So to accept the responsibilities of pastor is a big deal. It's a big deal. And all preachers aren't pastors. A lot of preachers preach, but they're not called a pastor. And uh, this is not saying it in a, in a derogatory sense. But it's simply saying that they're not called a pastor. So what you have in the book of Revelation chapter number 1 is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ revealing himself to his believers, his body, in a way that gets very, very uh, personal, very personal. 
And then he tells them exactly how he stands in relationship to them. You see, we are certainly uh, in Christ and nobody can pluck us from his hand. But you see, Revelation chapter number 1 and 2 is dealing with him in the corporate sense that he relates to his body, to the church. See, not the individual, to the church. Notice that these letters are the seven churches of Asia Minor, not individuals. When you read Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, you are reading epistles written to individuals. Therefore, God relates to them on an individual basis. You see, and He'll relate to you on an individual basis. If you have sin in your life, He'll deal with that. But here in Revelation, and this is what's so important to understand about this, He's dealing with a church as a corporate body. Temple Baptist Church as a body of believers. We have a testimony. Everlast Church has a testimony. That's right. Good or bad. Good or bad. One kind of testimony or the other. We have a testimony and He stands in the midst of us. And we all gather around Him. Here it's only seven. But we know that the, that the churches that make up the body of Jesus Christ number in the tens of thousands. Or even the hundreds of thousands. And that every last one of them have, have the same relationship with Him that we do. He stands in the midst and He judges the churches. See, as a body. That's so important to get this. As a body of believers. Therefore, He can judge a whole body of believers. He can judge a whole church. He can hang Ichabod on the back door. The Holy Spirit can move up and leave a church. A church can lose its witness in the community. It can lose the power of God in the presence of the Lord Jesus. Those are the important things. We can have games. We can have this and have that. Till we're blue in the face. But the world can have games. The thing that makes us different is when men and women come in here and they sense the presence of somebody bigger than us. Someone or something greater than humanity. That's what the church is about. It's about its testimony of Jesus Christ. The ultimate testimony of this church is not how big it is or how many folks we got buried out back or what we did 50 years ago or what group we belong to or even how much money we take up. The testimony of Temple Baptist Church, how strong is Jesus Christ in that church? Amen. Amen. How strong is he? Do you see eyes of fire, feet as fine brass? When his voice speaks in this house, does it shake like a waterfall? Do you sense that white hair, the judge of mankind, the eternal one of the ages? Do you understand by saying that he's girt about the paps with a golden girdle, he's both prophet, priest, and king? That means that in this house, Jesus Christ gets all the glory. Jesus Christ is the object of our affection. Jesus Christ is the purpose in coming together in this place. He pulls us together. That's what we have in common. You could go out of this building tonight, and I guarantee you, folks, there gonna be, there's going to be a lot of things you don't have in common. Some like to hunt, some like to fish, some like to shop, some like to go here, some like to eat this, some like to drive that. Don't have this in common. But we're all gathered together in here tonight because we have one thing in common. Amen. That's why we're in here. We're in here because we're a Baptist preacher. <laughs> I hope there's a little higher calling than that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now you notice what he did? The first thing he did, and Revelation gets rough, folks. Now the book of Revelation gets real rough later on. We got men gnawing their tongue for pain, wanting, desiring to die and can't. We've got the pit of hell opening up in the book of Revelation. Creatures coming up out of the pit of hell. We've got the seas turning to blood. We've got stars coming down from heaven, smashing into the earth. We've got an antichrist that rises up and causes the whole earth to receive his mark. The book of Revelation, demonic forces are turned loose on this earth like it's never seen before. The book of Revelation gets into some stuff that will blow your mind. People are starving to death. Famines riding on a horse. Wars riding on a horse. Death and hell are riding on a horse. The Antichrist comes out riding on a horse. The book of Revelation opens up earth, hell, and heaven. In other words, it opens up the spheres of creation. 
The book of Revelation opens all of the creation. It's all in the book of Revelation. Everything that relates to the creature is in this book. And you come down toward the end of the book of Revelation. And the Bible says the heavens and the earth flee away in a great white throne. And God Almighty Himself, Jesus Christ, is sitting on that throne to judge creation. The book of Revelation then begins to move off into eternity. Shows you a new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. 1,500 miles that way. 1,500 miles that way. And 1,500 miles that way. A perfect cube. The new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. A beautiful, marvelous thing. And then the book of Revelation opens up eternity itself. Where this sits above the earth and the earth beneath it. And the creatures on the earth and those in heaven and those with Jesus and those with the Lord God. And the book of Revelation covers all of that. And yet the first thing that's dealt with in the book of Revelation is the church of God. You know why? Judgment begins at the church of God first. At the house of God. Why? Because you've got the light and they don't. You've got the privilege, they don't. You've got the message, they know nothing about it. The entrance of thy words giveth light, giveth understanding the simple. If I had not come and preached unto you, you would not have had sin. But now you have no cloak for your sin. When that blazing light shines into the soul, it illuminates the heart into the soul and takes him up into the presence of God, shows him what a creature he is and for his creator. And the work of the Holy Ghost is to make you bare before God where you're not compared with a man here and a man there, but it's just you and God. And that Holy Spirit begins to open you up and unzip you from the inside out. And the Holy Spirit brings you before God convicted as a sinner without hope and without God. And then in that relationship and understanding that you and you alone have sinned. I'm going to hell because what I did is pre, it's between God and me. The work of the Holy Ghost is that by convicting you let, that way, you can be saved. And that should have happened to every one of you tonight if you've been born again. Well, when that happens, the Holy Ghost takes up residence inside you. You've got God Almighty living in you. If you've got God living in you, that means you've got one in you the world doesn't know anything about. They don't know God. They can't find God. Wouldn't know Him for the sign. The only thing about God, the only thing a heathen pagan understands about God is what's superstitious and he can see with the five senses. That's all he knows about God. That's all. That's all he'll ever know about God. And all he'll ever be is dust. Unless God reaches down and changes him from a child of dust into a child of God. So it starts with us first. It does. It does. It does. Us. The church. You can't get away from it. So I don't like that preacher. I can't help it. It's us. Are you telling me he holds me more accountable for what's going on than he does? Yes, I'm telling you he certainly does hold you more accountable. Yes, sir, I'm telling you he holds you more, far more accountable. Because the only thing the world can do is react what you know the, by the word of God and by prophecy is to act. We are in the last days. We are at the door. I firmly believe it. I firmly believe it. We are at the door. It's just about time for the Antichrist to rise up. He's got everything in place just about. They've been working at it a long time. They've had some dry runs before. They put out their feelers before. They've tried this and tried that. And they learned their lessons when they did it. They learned their lessons with Adolf Hitler. They did, a lot, they did a lot with Hitler. They tried him. They used Hitler. They learned a lot with Hitler. One small country, Germany. You ever looked at a map? Have you ever looked at a map of Europe? Have you ever looked at how big Germany is? And look at Germany compared to Europe. Look at Germany compared to the United States. Russia. Look at that huge thing. Yet that one small country, for the first two or three years of that war, the momentum was in their favor. Blitzkrieg is what it was called. Lightning war. They invented it. They overran Poland overnight practically. And Czechoslovakia went into France and marched down the Champs-Élysées. They went and they, they overran the Maginot Line. Germany literally drove people insane for the first two or three years. And then it began to change. The Allies began to join together, get their act together. The United States, Great Britain, Australia, Canada. And then finally Italy switched sides in the middle of the war. 
And things started changing. D-Day, when they hit the beach over there at Normandy, they started driving into, in, in, that was the death knell for Hitler. But they learned a lot with Adolf Hitler. In the year 2000, I firmly believe this, when the time switched over on these computers, and they had Y2K. How many remember Y2K? For months, some of the smartest men on the Internet were warning people it could be one of the worst catastrophic events that could happen in this country. They began to tell people what could happen when computers weren't able to switch the dates because of some glitch in it or somehow or another from uh, 1999 to the year 2000. And so everybody was, 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 was worried about it, all right? And, and, a, and a, lot of, a lot of preparation went into Y2K. You know, they said airplanes could start falling out of the sky and, 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 and navigational systems could go awry and, and, and satellites could come down out of the heavens and so forth and so on. All kinds of things, Y2K. Well, it wasn't near as bad as they thought it was going to be. But do you know what? They did something at Y2K they'd never done before. They went completely around the world with computers connected one to another, communicating with each other to make sure that the glitches weren't uh, stopping this and stopping that. In plain words, they did a test run all the way around the globe, and they used Y2K as a smokescreen for it. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they did. It was not a non-event. It was an event. They're getting ready. They're getting ready. They're preparing to put their man on the stage. And when he rises up, folks, the world... The only thing they're concerned about is six-pack and sex. How do you know that, preacher? Well, how many churches are going to close their doors next Sunday night? No. Nah. How many already have closed their doors on Sunday night? Most of these megaliths around here, you drive by them and they don't have service on Sunday night. Why? Well, you say, preacher, you don't have to go to church on Sunday night to go to heaven. No, you don't. No, you don't. But there's something about making a statement. There's something about just being there. You know, just saying something. And, uh, and uh, so next Sunday night, the Super Bowl comes along and one football team plays another football team and they'll put giant screens up and some of these churches will be drinking Budweiser and Slits and Blue Ribbon and, and the Heineken and Back Becks and whatever else they'll be drinking. And they'll be having a big time and then they'll have prayer meeting afterward. Now... Here's the problem. A lot of these churches don't see anything wrong with that. See anything wrong with it. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Okay? Now, if the rapture took place next Sunday night, right after the Super Bowl, <laughs> who do you think he's going to come and get? The Super Bowl doesn't mean anything to the Lord. He's not on this side against that side. Doesn't matter to him. They can get down there and pray all they want to. <laughs> you know, God be with our team, blah, blah, blah. The only thing, if I, if I was a football player, I'd just say, God be with me. I don't break a leg while I'm out there, you know. But uh, make a difference to the Lord. You know, he's not interested in who wins. But the problem is that we're lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So they got that in. What's next? What's next? You see what I mean about judgment beginning at the house of God? See what I mean? Nobody says a word about a bar being open next Sunday night and a 50-inch screen on the side of the wall and two or 300 people there watching. That's, no, that's nothing. That's nothing. It's, it is nothing. But when the church does it, see what I mean? It is something, isn't it? It's something when the church does it. Why? Because the church has a standard that's higher, different, not same. Amen. I'm glad I know him tonight. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Father, I pray you'd use what I've said, Lord. Bless my brothers and my sisters, Father. I pray what I've said has been helpful. God, tonight I pray that we see in this how you're dealing, Father, with a church as a group, as a body. Lord, I want temple to go on, Father. I want it to carry the torch. I want it to stand firm and true with the Word of God. I want it to be faithful, Father. I want it to be faithful. God, my ministry in this house, Lord, is to preach your word, to be true to you, Lord Jesus, is to preach the truth of your word. 
And all I ask from thee, Father, is anointing and unction, wisdom, and give me grace by the sweet Holy Spirit to be a pastor that you've called me to be. And bless the people, Father, and give them ears to hear, Lord. And God, let them ever understand, Lord, that I'm no great minister, that we're all the same when it comes ministering the oil and the wine into the hurting soul. We're all the same. My position, my place, my responsibility is as a bishop, as the pastor. And that's where it ends. In Jesus' name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it.